Tips of the Scale, episode 32. Welcome to tipsofthescale.com, your home for weight loss motivation. Tune in every week for weight loss success stories from around the world and for expert tips on diet and exercise. And now, your host, Sam Lamelli. Hey there, Scale Warriors, and thank you so much for joining me for another episode of Tips of the Scale, your home for weight loss motivation. Do you love great audio content? I know you do because you listen to this show. If you want to support Tips of the Scale, please go to scale.fm slash audiobook and sign up for a free trial of audible.com. You'll get a free audiobook from their over 150,000 title library, and you can listen anytime, anywhere on your iPhone, Android, Kindle, and many other devices. So again, support this podcast and go to scale.fm slash audiobook. Okay, Scale Warriors, let's get started. I'm thrilled to introduce my guest today. And this is Joe from Southern England in the United Kingdom. I'm super excited to have him on the show. Joe, how are you today? I'm well, thank you, Sam. It's a pleasure to be on. Thank you. I'm, I'm so excited to have you on. And I'm very glad that, that you made time in your, in your evening today to spend with us here at Tips of the Scale. So I've given our, our listeners just a really brief introduction about you. But go ahead and take a minute and uh, tell us more about yourself. Help, help us get to know you. Sure. I'm a 43-year-old male. I'm married and I live and work about an hour north of London uh, in the finance and accountancy field. So uh, I have a sedentary office job, uh, basically. It's, it's challenging, it's, it's good fun, but it is hard work. Very good. I think a lot of people can relate to what it's like to be in an office all day. I, I know I, I certainly feel it when I've been sitting for too long. We'll get a little bit more into kind of lifestyle and, and that here in a little bit. I'm really excited to get started. So thanks for giving us that that intro. As you know, Joe, we like to start off tips of the scale with a motivational quote to get the inspirational ball rolling. So what do you have for us today? Okay, I'm going to give you an oldie but a goodie. <laughs> it's Carpe Diem, uh, which is the Latin for seize the day. Yes. Um, the reason I like it, Sam, is because when I was younger, I didn't really understand it. But I think now I realize that each day when I wake up, that's a, a unique day. That's not going to happen again. It's a one off. And when I go to bed at night, I want to be sure that that day has meant something, that I've done something that day that's positive, whether it be diet related or not, but that I have done something that makes that day good for me. And that's why it's become an important motto for me. Mm, I can definitely understand why. That's such a powerful outlook and a great way, in my opinion, to, to live one's life. Thank you for sharing that with us today. So now that we've gotten to know you just a little bit, let's let's dive into your story. And let's go back to kind of where it all began for you, Joe. When did the weight gain begin for you? And what do you think contributed to it? I have been overweight since I was about eight years old. So I was the fat kid from way back when. And I've been trying to look at the reasons why that happened. Uh, at the, uh, just my background is I'm uh, the son of immigrants. And so we, we came in, they came into England uh, in the 1950s. And back then, it was a difficult environment. You don't have the sense of acceptance you have now. There was a lot more uh, racism and, and problems in that regard. So mm. I kind of stayed at home, became the bookish kid who would read and study. And it was easier than going out and facing the world. And one thing that became a, a comfort for me or a solace for me was food. Again, as an immigrant, I was always told, you know, back home, the people there are starving, you know, clean your plate. Mm -hmm. um, and because that made my parents happy, I did. And, uh, also, my mother, she is a great cook, which <laughs> doesn't help. Um, so it really, it was food is something that gives me solace, comfort, and uh, it doesn't criticize and it doesn't give you a problem. It, it, it you know, you can nurture it. So uh, that, I think, really is the source of what made me overweight. Um, at, my, at my heaviest, I think I was probably a little north of 300 pounds or 136 kilograms. Um, I didn't really weigh myself then uh, because I really avoided the scales. I, I didn't want to face what I, what I knew. Right. That really is uh, where, where it's been, I've always been the big kid. Um, 
Um, I mean, I'm big framed anyway now. I'm broad shouldered, but uh, just from a weight perspective, it's ever since childhood. Yeah, I can relate to what that was like. Now, now share, with, share with us a little bit about what that was like for you from a emotional and maybe physical difficulties. You know, what, what kind of challenges did you run into as a direct result of being overweight? I think emotionally, um, a lot of people who are overweight and obese will probably relate to a reduced sense of worth or mm. self-image. Um, I, why do I say that? Well, it's, it's still okay. Even today, it's still okay to make fun of fat people. You know, there it's still not seen as a as a bad thing to do. Whereas making fun of somebody's um, sexual orientation or or religious or, or ethnicity isn't acceptable. But making fun of somebody's obesity, regardless of how they got into that situation, is is seen as just being you know okay. And obese people are seen as being in some ways architects of their own misfortune, mm-hmm. and therefore. Uh, you know, their game, their fair game. Um, so that emotionally, that puts, um, certainly from my perspective, it always put me on the defensive. Um, if, if I would meet new people or in business situations or potential social situations, you would always feel you were being judged on your appearance, not on what was inside, whether I was a, a good guy or a bad guy, but just basically on how I looked. And that was and has contributed to its own difficulties growing up. Um, um, physically, I mean, I think it's from, well, in school, always being picked last for mm. any team sports, always yeah. feeling you know, the outsider. I mean, kids are terribly cruel anyway, and they, they will poke fun. Um, but even after I became an adult, um, if I were to say reunions were something I wish I could have gone to, but avoided, mm. um, I've avoided seeing old friends because I've gotten bigger as I've gotten older. And, you know, that, it, it really affects your life. And physically, you, you can't do as much. Um, I, you know, I remember huffing and puffing. Even a short flight of stairs would be uh, enough to make me sweat. Um, I would always feel hot in the office. I would always want the windows open with, if everyone else didn't. Yeah. <laughs> My knees... Um, I've got a bum left knee and that is not helped by the weight. Um, I'll give you a couple of other examples of physically how things are affected. Little little things around the house, basic home maintenance. Uh, When I was younger and more flexible and and lighter, I could could do things. But when you get to a certain size, I'm worried about going up into my attic to fix something um, and doing it safely because I'm now over the safety threshold of my ladder. Um, and so you don't want to do much. You don't want to move around much. It becomes easier to be sedentary and, and to lie on the couch. Yeah. Um, so that's really some of the emotional and physical. Unfortunately, it seems like the less that you're able to do, the less active you become. And it just turns into a cycle. Is that safe to say? You're absolutely right, Sam, because what happens is you feel bad. And what's your comfort? What's your first choice of comfort when you feel bad? For me, it would be something sugary, it would be mm-hmm. carbs, it would be a, a nice French baguette, and you know, anything like that would be my solace. So it's a vicious cycle. Yeah, I, I hear that. I hear it in your voice. What what kind of things did you try over the course of the, of the years that didn't work for you? I, I've done something. I With dieting, um, my approach has always been to try and go full tilt. So what I would do is I would think I had to exercise, but it wouldn't just be a gentle exercise and gently trying to get into something. No, it would be from being sedentary to going 20 miles on, on a bike <laughs> or, or, you know, 70, 80 minutes in, in the gym, which naturally means you have real aches and pains the next day or oh, two. Yeah. And that would give me fatigue or it would make me even more hungry. And that would lead to food and that would lead to a sense of failure. And I was a classic yo-yo dieter. I have been a classic yo-yo dieter for the last, easily the last 10, 12 years where I've sort of lost 20 pounds, gained 20 pounds, lost 20, gained 30, that kind of um, regime because I, I wouldn't be able to keep up with the diet for more than two months before I fell off the wagon. Yeah, especially at, at the... 
at the velocity that it sounds that you liked to to start them off at. That'd be really difficult, I think, for anybody to maintain just that 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 kind of work on on the body, especially when when you're not used to it. Yeah, and I think it's um I had I never realized how much food played um, its role as opposed to exercise. I thought I could outrun a bad diet, mm. and you can't. Yeah, so true, so true. I, I, the more of these interviews that I do, the more I, I'm hearing that consistent theme that it's, you know, I, I hear the saying is it's 80% diet, 20% exercise. And so I, I want to dive into a little bit more of the details of the successful diet and that transition into it that, that you eventually reached. But I do want to touch on something that is important to me personally, and I like I like to make sure we we touch on this with every one of my guests. That is, what was the moment for you? And by the moment, I mean what was the thing that finally sparked something different in you and made made it so that this time it was different? What was that thing for you this time? Okay, Sam, I'm going to be a bit uh, greedy here, and I should, <laughs> <laughs> but I've had two moments. Um, okay. Um, let me tell you the first one. The first one, I was 24 years old. So it's sort of, you know, a little uh, under 18 years ago. I was about 240 pounds or 111 kilos. And it was a humorous but hurtful comment from a male work colleague about uh, man boobs or moobs as they're now known. Mm. And at that time, I really felt hurt by his uh, comment on my physical appearance. And I then really took up a diet, an extreme diet, and we're talking, you know, 600 calories a day, uh, which led me to lose between 15 and 20 pounds a month until I hit my goal of about 170, 175 pounds. So that was a moment, but that isn't, that was, a, how can I put it? It, it? That's a negative moment. But what's happened to me later, 18 years uh, later, was um, slowly you know, um, what happened 18 years later? I'm married, I'm reasonably successful, I'm living the good life, you know, good wine, good cheeses, good food, (laughs) you know, foreign holidays, and I'm still dealing with the emotional issues of food. Um, I'm still not resolved in my mind about what role food plays in my life. And so here we are, it's January 2013, I'm about 300 pounds and I get an extremely painful area upper in my che- in my chest, and I don't know what it is. Yeah. Um, it turns out it's um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Now it's a silent killer, Sam. It's uh, something that will affect more and more people from the US and the UK and worldwide. It's where your liver has basically said, "I can't cope anymore." Mm. I. I've had enough, I'm breaking down, I'm shutting down. And um, it is something that is reversible. But for me, it was my wake up call, because my body had said to me, that's it, Joe, you're, you're out of luck. You've had all the breaks, you've, you've managed this far, you've managed sort of, you know, 42 years, but now you are in trouble. And for me, that was the real wake up call. That was the moment where I thought, I, I I sensed my own mortality and had to change. Wow. So with that, you know, staring you in the face and, and the realization that your body was, was starting to, to shut down, what, what, were, what were the first steps for you? How did you start? What did day one look like? And, and did you run into any obstacles at the beginning? Day one was shock. It was, and, and actually I will say, Sam, the first two weeks of me changing my diet habits were difficult and uh, uh, really I was really grouchy Mm. I was I don't know how my wife didn't leave me (laughs) during those first two weeks because I was cranky I was you know shouting and argumentative and and just really really unpleasant because I couldn't get my fix of Mm. sugar or donuts or or all the good things you know that I that I normally would would like to have um and uh, in terms of starting the diet I decided to do something I knew I couldn't do exercise so I knew it had to be diet um what what I mean by I couldn't do exercise was I physically was in so much pain and things were so difficult that I couldn't really walk for any more than say 10 or 15 minutes before I had to stop 
Um, and that wasn't because of, of my weight, but it was because the liver was uh, not working uh, very well. And uh, I was in a, a heck of a lot of pain, really. So I knew it had to be food. So I, I looked up resources. I went online, which, which is something I, I, I didn't do way back when, when, <laughs> when I was younger. <laughs> I wish I had. And discovered more about the things that we all know are good for us. Uh, fresh fruit, vegetables, pulses, brown foods. So, you know, un- instead of uh, refined foods, unrefined foods. Mm. Um, and I basically went down to about a thousand calories a day of really, really good nutrition. So it was a quite a big calorie deficit, but I was desperate because I, I just had to lose some weight. My doctor said, Joe said, if you lose 15, 20 pounds, this pain could go away. Well, okay, 15, 20 pounds is, is, is it achievable? And I went about doing that. And uh, then I just uh, found it was easy. Hmm. Um, it was easy for one real strange reason. Um, no sugar. I stopped all added sugar. And I have not had any hunger pangs in nine months. And I, I kid you not, not one cheat day, not one uh, craving of any kind, because I've cut out all additional sugar. That is amazing. So clearly it wasn't an easy transition. You said those first two weeks were, were not fun for you or your wife. And I, I can imagine. But what was your your way of staying focused and, and staying disciplined and not giving up through those two weeks and beyond into this into this lifestyle change? So for the first two weeks, it literally was, it's a choice between pain and, you know, I had time off work, which I didn't want. And, you know, the, the, the idea that my lifespan could be shortened or, or I could have a miserable, uh, last few years of life. There was that on one side of the scale, mm. uh, versus me just getting through these 20 pounds and that would mean I'd be okay after that. So though that was what initially what, what happened, but um, tr- truthfully, af- after I started replacing all of my refined carbohydrates and, and cheese and all that kind of thing with, with fresh, wholesome food, home cooked, um, you know, high fiber, low fat. When I replaced that, I found that I just didn't get hungry. It was um, amazing. And it's it's still to this day, it amazes me still. <laughs> Isn't that something? You're eating so much less than you were before, but just by changing the, the content of those things, you're way less hungry than you ever experienced in the past. Yeah, and I mean, there's good science behind it. Um, you know, everybody knows that fiber is good, not just because it, it keeps you regular, but also insoluble fiber is great for your arteries, but it keeps you fuller longer. Um, you know, having that slow progress uh, through your system means you you don't have the spikes in insulin, which can lead to the cravings. And uh, I used to be a, a the carb king, I'd call myself, because <laughs> uh, I could eat an entire pound f- a loaf of French bread easily oh, in sitting, yeah. easily, you know, and and maybe maybe even more. So to go from being the carb king right down to being able to regulate the carbs. I'm, I'm, I'm not one of these people that thinks all carbs are evil or, you know, I, I must go keep into keto or anything. I'm happy to have good carbohydrates, uh, brown rice, uh, millet, um, you know, whole foods like that. So that really, truthfully, I can say has been the key to success for me. That is awesome. Now, let's get into the specifics of it. I, I want our listeners to to kind of follow us through the course of, of a typical day for you. You know, what does your breakfast consist of? What is your typical lunch? Do you snack? And if so, what do they look like? Help us out with that. Um, okay. I'm in some ways, I'm really bad because I, I don't like getting up. So <laughs> I will usually get up really late and then have to rush to work and therefore skip breakfast which I know is one of the cardinal sins and everyone says you must never skip breakfast. But um, when I do have breakfast, it will generally be something. I mean, for me, the, the, the breakfast of champions is, is uh, all bran. I don't know if you know what all bran is. It's a high fiber bran yeah. cereal. Mm-hmm. 
and that with a sliced banana, for example. So, you know, about 300 calories of of a good mixture of, of sugars and and fiber uh, with some skimmed milk. That that does me a treat. And uh, lunch, uh, again, if I'm working, uh, this is, uh, again, all the, all your listeners should not do what I do in this <laughs> regard, okay, because I'm, I'm not a good example here. But I generally tend to work through lunch. I'm getting the American disease of working through oh, your no. <laughs> Oh, yes. We're slowly becoming like that over here in the UK. Um, I, I have, though, started taking time out to go for a, a short walk at lunchtime or just... Good. Good. A change of uh, a change of pace and a change of uh, sitting in front of the screen. Um, but uh, if I do have lunch at weekends, when I do, my, my lunches will be, uh, for example, uh, it can be lean um, meat or fish. I'm increasingly becoming more vegetarian, just as a as a choice, but I still do um, occasionally in, indulge. So, for example, it will be lean white fish with. Um, something like uh, brown rice risotto. Um, I'm really getting into more Asian flavors at the moment. So mm. um, stir fries are something that I'm I'm discovering because I can make something which is normally quite bland and boring, like white cabbage or, or, or broccoli. And uh, when you add in something like five spice or and ginger and chilies, you suddenly transform it um, at no cost in calories into something that's flavoursome and appetising. But uh, I can still eat a big bowl of it and uh, know that I'm, I'm still doing only 350 or 400 calories. So I know I'm on track on budget for my calorie goal in the day. Um, and my main meal usually is the evening meal. And I will generally stick to a, a South Indian dishes I'm very fond of. So, um, again, dishes that are just good fiber and and good nutrients uh, my my mantra is calorie sparse nutrient dense so what i mean by that is uh, let me explain that a bit more it's it means for every calorie you consume make sure it is the best calorie you can get so it's full of good essential minerals and a it, it's free of uh empty calories and so i try and get my sort of 1200 calories a day and each one of those has got to have the right balance of things like you know zinc or selenium or magnesium or all these kind of things that are that are good for you. Mm -hmm. um, and it it really becomes after a while it becomes a, the norm uh, and doesn't become something that you have to think about. But certainly for the first two or three months, um, there was a lot of research about what were good foods versus bad foods um, for me. So that's um, that's a typical day. Uh, I drink far too much tea and coffee, <laughs> um, <laughs> but without any sugar and with a, just a dash of milk. And one of the key things I found for helping hunger as well is keeping your fluids up. The number of times I have perhaps thought I might be a little hungry when in fact it was thirst, um, I can't count. I, I would say nine times out of ten, when I thought I'm a little hungry, I haven't been. I've been thirsty. Um, and the other thing that I've done, which really helps, is I've slowed down my eating. Um, mm. I used to wolf food down. You know, it would be gone in gone in 60 seconds. And <laughs> now I take my time over it. I savour it more. And I try and make it much more of a, an occasion with the family yeah. rather than just something to cram in. And um, that also enables me to, to wait for my food to digest. Right. Uh, for me, there's this magic 20 minutes, uh, which is the 20 minutes I wait. When I finish any meal, if I think I'm a little more hungry or I think I need a little more, I'll wait 20 minutes. And if I still do, okay, then I'll have a little more. But again, I'll say 99 times out of 100, I don't really need it. It's just that my my stomach and my system needs a bit of time to process uh, and send the signals to my brain to say, "Hey, Joe, you're full up. You're okay. You're yeah. good." Yeah, I've, I've heard I've heard something really similar before. Where I, I don't know that there is a, a set time. I, I think it, it's different for everybody, but something in the neighborhood of fifteen to twenty minutes, I, I hear frequently as basically the amount of time it takes your brain to get the message from your stomach that you're full. 
And if you're just wolfing down food, you, you could be eating over the course of those 15 minutes before you re even realize you should have stopped 15 minutes ago. Absolutely. It's such an important thing to, to, to chew, to properly chew your food, to take it slow and, and to let your body catch up with your stomach. Absolutely. I found that uh, if I didn't wait for that time, that, that, that period of time, that 15 or 20 minutes would be the time where I'd have seconds. Mm. And it would only be after that time that I would suddenly discover I was over full and I'd really feel stuffed. Yeah. So it's an important uh, piece of time for people to take, um, do some, you know, to do something else entirely and um, see how they feel after that. Yeah. So there's a couple of things I want to touch on. You mentioned that you did quite a bit of research during the, the course of that time where you were learning about different ways of, of getting the best nutrition from your food. Now, what were, what were some things you learned there that were complete surprises to you that you didn't know prior to this research? I, th I think for me, I didn't know that a Snickers bar would take me an hour to an hour and a half of walking to work off mm. or, or, or a cookie could perhaps take two hours. I, I didn't realize that with exercise, and, and I'm not knocking exercise, I, I, I love exercise and I'm a regular exerciser now myself, but for, for me with food, that, that was one of the big eye-openers for me. No, nobody told me that that mattered more. Um, the food mattered way more than the exercise, but it certainly does. Yeah, it's when you put it into a comparison of how long it takes to eat 300 calories versus how long it takes to burn it off, it gets a lot easier to put that cookie away or, or that, that bag of chips away or something like that because it, it really takes a lot longer than most people assume it does. And then that's, that's not the first time I hear that. And that's such an important lesson because I hear people say, Oh, I can, I can have this burger or this slice of pizza or this fried meal. I'll work it off later. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll run an extra 20 minutes on the treadmill or I'll, I'll, I'll do, you know, a couple minutes of jumping jacks or, or jump rope or something like that. And the misguided notion that they'll balance each other out when in reality, you know, to burn off 300 calories for some people can be an hour of walking. Absolutely. At the moment, for me to burn off 300 calories takes me about 25 to 30 minutes of, of jogging. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that puts things into perspective. That makes that donut not such an attractive option. Yeah, it's, it's not a good use of your time to, to do with those calories. That's such an important thing. I'm, I think that you learned it this time around with this effort at losing weight was probably one of the, the key things that made you successful this time. Oh, I mean, there are, there are a couple of other resources. Uh, w within Reddit, uh, there is a subgroup called Lose It, mm -hmm. and it is a really great resource. I found it has helped me uh, keep motivated and also to help, I hope, motivate others um, as well because it's a, a support forum for like-minded people and, in, and I think it's one of the nicest places on the internet. There are so many great people out there who, who will give help and support. So that has been a useful resource. Um, I, I found that, that uh, the University of California in San Francisco, UCSF, did a great series called The Skinny on Obesity. And I kind of try and plug that whenever I can because for me it really helped me understand the role of of food in my life and and the role of sugar and exactly how it creates craving. So that really was a useful resource. Um, I'm, I'm going to plug another resource if I can as well. It's, this is yeah. a this is a non it's a non profit uh, organization. Um, uh, the website's called HelpGuide.org, and it's a, a non profit uh, based in the US um, who work with Harvard Medical School. And they had a great article on stress eating and mm. what causes stress eating. And it really helped turn things around for me, understand what the drivers were for my eating behavior. Um, so there are, pl there are plenty of great resources out there, uh, whether you want to plan meals, whether you want to budget for meals. Um, you know, Google is your, is truly your friend in, mm. nowadays. And, and you can, you can do great things for yourself. You can educate yourself and empower yourself. Yeah. Some great resources there. Thank you for, for mentioning those. I, I didn't know about that UCSF program, the, the skinny on fat. I'm, and I'm going to make sure that I link that up with the show notes so our listeners can, can check those out and, and learn like you did. So a couple of really good points there. You mentioned, you know, planning ahead. And I, I imagine that there were some, some things you changed in addition to, to 
just your day-to-day diet. What were some of the other ways that you managed yourself when you went out to eat? How did you how did you handle knowing that you were going to be looking at a menu that had, you know, not maybe not the healthiest choices? Did you plan ahead for that? And if so, how? It's one of the hardest things to do is to is to go out with friends, with family um, to a restaurant and think I can't eat. Mm. It's, it means, you know, you, it's, it's not a good feeling. So I will try and choose uh, chains or outside eating restaurants that have nutritional information. And there are a good few in the UK now who are publishing um, that information. So that allows us to make informed choices. So it means I can enjoy, for example, a pizza with salad, which is only 500 calories, which sounds insane, but there is one mm-hmm. uh, chain here in the UK that does really, really fancy pizzas. They're, they're fantastic. So you can, uh, you can eat out and you can eat out well, um, if you choose well. Um, I'll give you another example. Um, Sam, one of the worst places in the world you can go if you're trying to diet is on a cruise. Now, mm. uh, uh, my wife and I had a cruise booked. Uh, we booked it a long time ago and it was a two week cruise. And usually that is the start of a bad relationship with you <laughs> because you have endless all you can eat buffets, 24 yeah. seven pizza stations, etc. And the cruise line we went with, they themselves are realizing this and they do a, a special menu which is designed for people who are looking after their weight or, for for example, for diabetics who don't want um, sugar, etc. So we chose those healthy options. And again, they were calorie counted and balanced and they were fantastic. They were some of the, you know, the, the meals look better than some of the, the regular options. Um, and I actually lost in, in two weeks, I lost six pounds on that cruise, wow. <laughs> which I think has got to be, uh, uh, you know, for me, it's a record anyway, but uh, <laughs> it's because we were active, you know, we were sort of walking four or five miles a day in, in, in all these new cities and also having a healthy lifestyle. And they had a gym on board as well. So you, you can do it. You it, Going on a diet doesn't mean you become a hermit. You, you know, you kind of have to hide yourself away or you, you, you become some kind of uh, food freak. It, you can live your life and enjoy uh, a good, healthy, balanced diet. It's entirely possible. Right on. And you're, you're a perfect example of that. If anyone could, can lose weight on a cruise, one of the most tempting places of, uh, on, on the planet. I know that everyone I know who's been on one, uh, one of the things mentioned is like the never ending ice cream, the never ending buffet is just like you mentioned. And it's, can be such a temptation, but I, I think you're a testament to the fact that if you are keeping yourself disciplined, then it's absolutely possible. And enjoyable. And enjoyable, absolutely. There's so much to do on there besides eat. I'd imagine you, you probably had a better time than than the folks who were gorging themselves and then had to go and pass out in their cabins because they, they had eaten too much. Oh yeah, and we um, little things like, for example, not taking the the elevator or we call them lifts here in the UK. Right. Uh, so we would always go up and down the stairs. So you can do things, even just little things, small steps, small changes um, during the course of, of any day um, to help yourself. Very cool. So that brings me to, to something else I wanted to touch on. You mentioned that you you exercise a lot more these days than you in the past. What kind of routine or, or regimen are you keeping up with now? Okay. Well, let me say, I've, I want to say some one important thing first. The first 60 pounds that I lost was done through walking alone as an exercise. There was no biking. There was no running. I couldn't physically do it because I wasn't well enough. Right. So for anyone out there who thinks I can't exercise, I can't get on a, uh, an elliptical, I can't get on the, the treadmill, you don't have to. You can just go for a walk after dinner for 20 minutes and it begins. And the first 60 pounds of my loss, I'm currently at the 95 pound loss mark, but the first 60, so two thirds, has been solely through walking. Um, and after walking, I decided I was going to try a, a great little program called Couch to 5K. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, I think there's a, there's a bit of a cult following again on, yes. on 
on Reddit for it. And the goal of the program, which is completely free to use, you, you, I, I got my free podcasts from the United Kingdom's uh, National Health Service, where they do some fantastic free to download podcasts, which are timed and they've got music and, you know, they're fantastic. But uh, they're designed to take you from nothing, from you know, being able to barely run um, to five kilometers or, or at least 30 minutes running. And uh, I've just completed that um, and I've caught the bug. So <laughs> now <laughs> I am uh, trying to do the bridge to 10K. So uh, it um, it's a virtuous circle. So uh, it's, it's great that you can start these things, small things, one step at a time. And uh, you, you go from being a vicious circle into a virtuous circle. Um, and also, I'm, I've, I've discovered my, my bicycle again. Um, we've had great weather in, in, in the UK uh, recently, a wonderful sun, and just the uh, wind in your hair and, uh, you know, being able to, to get somewhere without worrying about the traffic jams uh, <laughs> is fantastic. It, it, so cycling and running are now my uh, primary forms of, of exercise. And I, I'm slowly sort of recovering health-wise, and, and I plan to start going back to doing a little lightweight training. Um, but as, as yet, I, I can't. But um, the, the takeaway here is you don't have to absolutely pound yourself uh, in, in the gym. You can do it through simple exercise alone. I'm proof of that. Absolutely. I think it's so important to to start at the pace that you can handle and adjust as you as you reach those milestones along the way. It sounds like you you had phases and the beginning was just walking like you said and then when you were ready for the next thing you took it up a notch and then when you were ready for the next thing so on and so forth and or now you're about to introduce weight training and and I mean did you think this is where you would be, you know, almost almost 100 pounds ago at, at this point? Did you think that you would be cycling now and considering lifting weights at this point? If, if you had said to me um, at the beginning of uh, February that I would be on my way to running a 10K <laughs> in, in eight months, I would have uh, you know, asked you to go and see a doctor, see if you're doing okay. <laughs> I uh, No, and uh, the, the thing is, it is doable, it's achievable. If, if you're out there and you're thinking, oh, well, this is a story of a guy um, who, who just did and, hey, I couldn't do that. Well, don't think that because... I have also been a failed dieter, you know, and, and I've, I've been a yo-yo dieter for 10 years, but a few simple changes and a few a little bit of education. And once you start changing you, the way you do things, instead of it becoming something that's a chore or something that's difficult, it becomes something that's natural and you're a normal part of your day. You don't have to think of it as, hey, I'm dieting today. It just is another day. Um, and it becomes part of a lifestyle. Before you know it, you've made that lifestyle change that people talk about. Yeah, it's 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 an interesting thing, right? The the small habits that you stick to slowly transform you into the you know the person you wanted to be if you if you started those habits with intention. Absolutely, and it just it, it's. I will say that the longest journey, the longest journey, starts by taking one step. I think that's something that, that I've, I really have found out for myself. Every journey begins with one step, but take that step. Absolutely. Some great advice. Uh, Joe, you know, I heard something in your voice there. I want to come back to you really, really quickly. And that, that's when did you know or have the realization that you were making progress? You know, where along the way did you actually step back and go, hey, I'm getting somewhere? And how did that feel? There were a couple of things. First of all, it was the the trousers uh, or pants, as you call them in the US, uh, were looser. Now, I was getting to the stage where I had a 46-inch waist and that was painfully tight and I needed to have uh, a 52-inch jacket. So, you know, a pretty big guy. And uh, when that 46-inch pair of trousers suddenly becomes comfortable and then becomes loose and you realize that it's bunching up then you realize something's happening and and initially it's hard for for yourself to personally accept that this is happening it's it's uh i think i look in the mirror and i think i've made no progress but the clothes will tell you something so i, I think i would say the tape measure is a really useful friend or your clothes are a really great friend because they don't lie. 
you know, whereas you, when you see yourself in the mirror, you may, for whatever reason, think that you haven't lost anything or you, th- you may even think you look worse, but your clothes won't lie. So that was one moment. And uh, the other moment was when work colleagues who have been, you know, to a man and woman, really supportive and really kind would say, hey, you're looking trimmer or, hey, you know, you're looking younger or, or hey, there's something about you that's changed. And that kind of praise uh, is is fantastic and it's, it keeps me going as well. That's awesome. That's got to be such a great feeling. And, and when you've been working so hard for it, it it's got to be fantastic. Now, looking back, you know, where, where you're standing now, almost 100 pounds lighter, now that you've been through this 100-pound journey, if you could have changed something or done something different, you know, maybe from something you've learned along the way or just now that you're you're a little wiser, um, if you could go back and, and change something, do something different, what would it be? Do you know, I, I don't know if it's do something different. I would just say that I would tell myself that this is something that you will love. Now, by that, I mean... I had always thought that this would be something I'd hate. It'd be pain every day. It'd be sacrifice every day. It would be, you know, every day would be a miserable day. But if there's one thing I could have told myself is that actually you will love this and you will really find it an enjoyable process. Um, You know, I think that would have made me even more motivated than I am now. Right on. Now, to to the person who is in those shoes, who's standing at just over 300 pounds where you started your journey and is listening to this and saying, that can't be me. Good for you, Joe. You got there, but I can't do it. What's one thing, you know, we, we're, we've talked about taking that first step. What's one step that you would recommend to someone out there to take today to start getting there? Okay. Start today. Don't say I'm going to start tomorrow. I'm going to start next week or I'm going to start, you know, after the next family get together start now and the one step i'd say is do something that you can do so if you drink sodas with sugar in them switch to a non-sugar version or switch to something like a sugar-free uh, cordial just begin one thing at a time and you will find that it becomes less of a huge step change to yourself uh, it's something that you can hopefully do one week at a time. So just what this week do one thing, next week do another, and eventually you'll find yourself wanting to do these things. And whether it be, am I going to take that that walk today? You know, it, hey, it's, the weather's not so great outside. Well, okay, get an umbrella. You know, <laughs> don't put off what you can do, but do something. Don't listen to this podcast and and then switch off and then think, I'll do this tomorrow. Don't do it now. Do it today. And then you have seized the day. I like that full circle. We are back to your quote and I see where it, where you live it. I, I love it, Joe. I love it. That's such great advice. And I, I agree with you a hundred percent. Start today. So Joe, you, you've given us some really great advice today, some really practical tips and, and some great insight into what this journey has been like for you. What, what are some helpful resources? You've already touched on a couple, but what are some other resources maybe you can recommend to our listeners? Um, I would recommend my fitness pal. It's a tool that helps you track your calories and it has got so many foods in because it's um, helped. The maintenance of it is done by users like myself. And I have found that really helped educate me into, you know, what a portion size was. And that is a really great, useful resource. And there are plenty of friends you will find on there. So my fitness pal, a great resource. Um, and also, uh, I'd recommend another one called The World's Healthiest Foods. If you just Google World's Healthiest Foods, it will be the top hit. It's like a non-profit organization. And there it it tells you what the most healthy foods are for the weight of food. For example, you know, you, did you know you could have a pound of, of kale with something like ginger and, and water chestnuts and, and it would be, you know, less calories than a cookie. And, wow. it, you know, it, it's just a great resource. Um, and that that's really useful. Um, Reddit, come along to Reddit. Uh, my name, my Reddit name is Vegmeister. So um, please say hello. I'm a, a frequent lurker and poster on the Lose It forum. 
and uh, it, it, it's where Sam got hold of me, actually. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, that's a great resource as well, full of supportive people. Absolutely, it's a it's a great community on there, and and I've had the pleasure of meeting people like you who have been very generous with their advice and their encouragement to others. So it, it's a very cool place. I would recommend it as well. Thank you for that, Joe. Thank you. So as we're as we're wrapping up here, I I'd, I'd like to ask this final question just as a, a fun thing that gives me a little more insight into into your personality and just something that our listeners can can go and explore as well. And that's you know what is a, a personal favorite either song or artist that you keep on your gym playlist to get you fired up for your workouts. Okay, for workouts, for running, I want something that's reasonably fast paced, and um, I have a secret love of techno music, <laughs> <laughs> which. I know I'm 43 years old and I'm listening to techno music. Yeah, I am. Oh, it's timeless. Um, <laughs> I love the Chemical Brothers. So I will get a, a whole sort of random list of, of work by the Chemical Brothers. And that will make that run, uh, that half hour run, seem like it's only a 10 minute run. Um, so I, I really recommend those. Very cool. They they definitely have some really great beats. I haven't I haven't heard some of their stuff in a while, but I I think I'm gonna go pull up a couple of their MP3s now. You'll enjoy it. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that, Joe. That's awesome. I'll link up. If, do you have a favorite a favorite song or a favorite album of theirs? Um, my favorite album is Surrender, Surrender, and it's a great album. Right on. I'll link to that album in the show notes, so our listeners who haven't had the pleasure of listening to Chemical to Chemical Brothers before can go check them out for themselves. And maybe maybe find something new they love and and can work out to as well. So Joe, we're, we're coming up on our time. And again, I want to thank you for, for being so generous with your time and advice today. What is one parting piece of advice that you'd like to share with our listeners? I would say, I think I just have to reinforce what I've said, is, which is begin, do it, just start today and don't put it off another day. Don't put it off till tomorrow. Tomorrow never comes. Carpe diem. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Very inspirational words and, and some great advice from, from Joe in uh, Southern England in the UK. Joe, thank you so much again for your time and all this great information today. Tips of the Scale is, is a, a better place for having your story today. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. And there we have it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us today on Tips of the Scale. Head on over to tipsofthescale.com for recaps of every show, links to all the helpful resources mentioned, and more. Here's to your weight loss success. 